Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our panelist. And first, I can see the wonderful Sarah Kate Ellis. Sarah, please come and join me here on the stage, president and CEO of GLAAD. Sarah Kate was a successful media executive before joining the organization and transforming it from a media watchdog into one of the most powerful cultural change agents across industries. Also joining us is Nigel Vaz. Nigel Vaz is CEO of digital business transformation company Publicis Sapient. Nigel has been with the company for over two decades and advises some of the world's largest businesses on their transformation initiatives. And then please welcome Chamba Chalemba. Chamba is a singer, songwriter, DJ and producer artist from Malawi. She is the founder of Tiwali, a community center in Malawi that supports women, girls and the non-binary through art, STEM, education, and economic programs. And last but not very least, we have Cami Christie. Cami is the co-founder and CEO of Elio, a company that is developing the AI-enabled software platform that helps manufacturers develop a decarbonization strategy. Welcome to all of you, to all of my amazing panel. And in the true spirit of the Visionaries Network, it's a reminder, it's not a Q&A, it's an exchange of ideas. So please relax, enjoy, and let's set the scene. All right. <laughs> so, Chamba, I'm going to start with you first. How did you come to set up Tiwali? I believe it was when you <coughs> were 17. Yeah, yeah. Um... It was out of a space of desperation, honestly. Um, so when I was 17, I had a close friend drop out of school. And the reason was that her parents had found someone to marry. And that person was going to support paying for her brother's education. So it was, this was, it was a shock and hurtful. But it wasn't surprising because this was what was common ground in Malawi. Um, this was 2012. Child marriage in Malawi was still legal. And so what we were seeing was a majority of young women being forced out of school at a young age and pressured into marriage. And a lot of that was that most families can't afford primary to secondary school education transition. So Tuale started then as a movement to first push for criminalization of child marriage, as well as also looking at ways that we can create spaces that either help young women stay in school or help find access to income generating activities. And from there now, today, we've shifted. Um, child marriage is illegal in Malawi now. And we've also shifted in terms of our programming. And now we're looking at another barrier, which is inequity in the music industry. And how do we get more women into the technical side of music, that is music production, DJing, and um, any kind of technical aspect of the music scene. Mm. Well, you're also a singer, songwriter, and a DJ. Were you always interested in music as a vocation? Absolutely. Uh, growing up, my dad had a lot of cassettes, and I used to get on his nerves because I would always <laughs> screw them out and try to make my own mixes. And so it started from a young age, but of course, growing up in an African household, when I told my parents, oh, I want to study music, I was like, uh-uh. So long story short, I have a degree in economics. And <laughs> so you know, you know how that conversation went. But, um, but when I started working and just being in my own spaces, I was always still making and creating music. And somehow music has found a way to weave itself into my life, into my career, and into who I am today, and even with the work that I do, um, creating spaces where people can find either a means of living or just a means of finding yourself through music has been the greatest gift of all. So the economics degree is resting somewhere peacefully, <laughs> but you know, I'm also grateful for that. Thank you, yeah. Chamba. And Kami, I want to ask you, can you describe Elio for us? Yeah, so, I mean, the premise of Elio comes down to really a question, which is how can a business figure out how to actually decarbonize, so reduce the CO2 emissions of a very complex process? Because at the moment, when you ask a decision maker in a company, like, let's say, let's pick a pharmaceutical company, because our first focus is on pharmaceuticals, Novartis or Roche, uh, we have some of the Hoffmans here, um, 
they answer you that the complexity of the situation of the process is far too great in certain situations to be able to actually understand what the solution landscape looks like. And so what we're doing is we're building an AI-powered software tool that acts as a partner supporting a scientist or a product designer in understanding what the solution landscape looks like and then enabling them to keep updating that, so that strategy as new information and data comes in. Fantastic. Nigel, of course, you're the CEO of Publicis Sapient, the digital transformational company. What was your own journey to CEO like? Well, interestingly enough, uh, for me, it started at 17 to, uh, oh. I started a company, uh, but the, the realization of why I wanted to start the company I did, which was focused on how businesses would leverage the internet as, as technology, came from the fact that as a child, I had very... Uh, a, a challenging time with fine motor skills, so I couldn't hold pencils or write. Mm -hmm. And technology at the time appeared to me a little bit like a superpower uh, in the context of cartoons. You know, you think about Iron Man and Captain America, they're all technology enabled. And so I started to think to myself that actually, if we can act, enable people and businesses with technology that enables them to do something dramatically different, um, we would actually help a lot more businesses be more successful. And so that was the journey. I started a company, and then I joined Sapient when it was very small. Today, we're, of course, in you know, lots of countries around the world, and we've spoken about this uh, you know, before. And that idea, that, that purpose of helping people thrive in the brave pursuit of what's coming next has always been central to the idea of what's motivated me. So how can we make you know, carbon emissions or sustainable choices easier? How can we help new products get to markets which perhaps desperately need them but aren't finding accessible ways in which to do things? You know, simple stuff like we worked in, in Kenya on M-Pesa way back in the day before, you know, which was a problem focused very specifically on migrant workers sending money back home. We also you know, built uh, some of the world's first equities trading platforms and online banking platforms because we realized that people who didn't have a lot of money were not going to get the kind of attention you'd want them to get from a stockbroker uh, you know, who'd call them at the end when all their more important clients were done. And, and, and those ideas back in the early days of the internet democratized technology to, to good. And we continue to do that today. So, so this idea of that purpose and digital for good is, is what drives Publicis Sapien. Thank you so much, Nigel. And Sarah Kate, I've had the pleasure of talking to you here in Davos previously. And of course, you're president and CEO of GLAD. You began in media, I believe. Tell us about your own journey. Absolutely. Um, so it's really interesting. I'm seeing the thread through all of this, which is about making the world a better place, especially for people who are marginalized or have disabilities or LGBTQ+. Plus, um, and live in communities which might not um, be safe. Um, so I, uh, yes, I did work in media for nearly two decades in very big brands like Time Inc. and Condé Nast at Vogue and InStyle and Real Simple because I understood the power and the influence of media and I thought I, it just was so magnificent to me what it could do, how it could shape our culture. Um, and so when my wife and I had our twins, I realized that it was time to do something even more powerful and important. And I joined GLAD because at GLAD we understand how to build influence and create change through media. And now what's fascinating since I've been there, I've been there nine years, gosh, has media changed, you know? <laughs> and so everyone is a creator now. Um, and everybody has that influence, or, or not everybody, I shouldn't say that, but a lot of people have influence. It's really spread and been de democratized in a lot of ways, which has opened up the possibilities for us um, as an organization. But that's what I do and where I do it. I want to talk about running a company now. Sarah Kate Jumbas Tawali is a youth-led organization. Is there, do you think, a generational difference when it comes to dealing with discrimination issues? 
Oh, I mean, I think that's a really big question. You know, I think because there are cultural changes, there's so many things at play. I think what's really important to focus on, though, is that this next generation and what they're doing, how they're building their businesses, is so different than anything we've ever seen. They're building their business with making the world a more equitable place and giving people who usually don't have a voice a voice in this world. That's not, you know, when I was growing up, and I'm, I'm US-based too, it really was about capitalism and making money. And I think that's a byproduct of what you all are doing now, not the end product. And so I think that the way this generation looks at the future is so hopeful for me because they're building their businesses on a premise of making the world a better place in a really, truly authentic way, not in a corporatized way of, like, we're going to build this to make money, and then on, we'll layer on some purpose. Chamba, when you did start mm. Tiwali, did people dismiss you as just, oh, she's 17, <laughs> she's too young? For yeah, yeah. Um, we had a lot of, we had our first radio interview, and there were two people that called in. One, what, these young people don't know what to do. They should go back to school. They should focus on staying in school. Two, it was, why are you empowering women? And you should be empowering everyone. There isn't, there isn't this gap. But um, for us, it was being in a desperate space as young people. Um, we had been, for, for a lot of African countries, we, um, we got our independence mid-50s, like 1950s, 60s. And during that time, our parents, who were, most of them who were in that transitionary period, were very much looking to the government that, okay, there's change and there's new governments coming in. And then over time, with our generation, we've seen the gaps within governance, but also we see, we see the opportunities. And what's, what the biggest challenge for us is that within those opportunities, there isn't space. And so Tuwale was founded, our oldest team member was 19, and the youngest person was 14. Mm -hmm. And the, the group of five of us that created the space, it was rather there's no spaces that are being created, and so we're going to have to just figure it out. And that's the challenge that when you look at this room, when you look at this space, how are we all ensuring that we continue to invite young people so that there isn't a desperate movement that then you end up with Youth World Economic Forum because that isn't being created. And so it was similar to us that in that space, it was just seeing that we're not being included in conversations that we now have to start something. So, Kate, where do you think we stand when it comes to young people and their views and their messages? I'm thinking about Greta Thunberg, for example. She's mm. come under fire from people much older than herself. So how can we protect different viewpoints? Yeah, well, I think, so from a U.S. perspective, um, I think when you look at the, the next generation, and I'm thinking mostly Gen Z, um, and the research that we do and the studies that we do to understand what's important to them and where they're focused, you can see the, the latest Gallup poll out of the United States identifies 20% of Gen Zers as LGBTQ. And so uh, their lens on life is so different. Um, and I think they look to how is this world, how are they building a sustainable world? And it's, it's wired in them. Um, and when we've, we've actually done our own survey, and we've seen that number double, actually, year over year, on LG, as, as folks that are LGBTQ in that demographic. So when they come into the corporate world, they are, I've had a lot of CEOs this week say to me, um, the next generation, this younger folks that are in my workplace make a lot of noise in a good way. I think they see it as a good thing, but it's pressure. It's definitely pressure to, to step out in ways that they haven't been out there before, to speak up in ways that they haven't had to speak up. And it's so refreshing for me to see this generation sort of take control of their narrative and lead it. Um, so I think that there's a lot of change. We're on the brink of a lot of change that you, you both in your generation are leading. And Nigel, I want to ask you when it comes to company decision making, is a variety of viewpoints you think useful 
Or is there a case for a more dictatorial, shall we say, Elon Musk way? Of <laughs> so? uh, I'd say, you know, for me, as a CEO and, and somebody who leads a business, it's always better to have more perspective, right? You can never have enough perspective because you're always not going to see something that somebody else sees from that vantage point. But what I would say, building on the the previous point is I feel like in organizations historically, there used to be this cognitive dissonance between what you were, what you said, and what you did. And certainly for how I try to lead and how I think more progressive organizations, you know, driven by people within the organization and outside is to reduce that cognitive dissonance because you have to be authentically something, say and then do you know, or, or rather do first and then say, which is, I think, the shift that, you know, Sarah's talking about from, from business. I remember uh, when I started my company, uh, I was pretty young too, and I had a, a colleague in the early fundraising rounds who was older, um, who I brought onto the team. And almost every VC, when we walked into the room, would start by addressing the older white guy. Because the general assumption was they must be the people who are leading a company, which is clearly asking to raise a lot of money. And, and honestly, that, I feel like, has not gotten as, as you know, significantly better as, as it should have in, in the time that has passed. And so we still have work to do, I think, to, to kind of close those gaps uh, of inequity where they exist. Have you ever had a client, though, Nigel, with that dictate? approach and how would you deal with that? Oh, oh, for sure. You know, I mean, if you think about business, I'd say the, the model for leadership came out of the military. You know, the bulk of how businesses were led came out of a command and control structure, which is, you know, I think the African proverb, right, which is when you want to go fast, the easiest way to do things. You put somebody at the top and you say, that person calls the shots and, you know, but when you actually want to move people together, and you want to go the distance, then being more inclusive, bringing and sharing perspectives is the way to go. And that, those two cultures do clash. I mean, often we'll work with clients where the answer is, I'll give you an actual specific example. We're building a really large um, digital commerce platform where the engineers and the data scientists looking at the data have a clear idea about what the next feature and function ought to be. But the way the company made decisions was the CEO decided what they did. And we had to shift the process by saying, your perspective is not the perspective of the people using right. your services and your platforms. And the data tells us this. And the people closest to the data are the people who are the most junior on your team who are living in this. So how do you empower them? And the only way that worked in that specific instance was to connect it to real dollars bottom line impact to basically say, you know, good business and good for business are the same thing. And, and you have to kind of enable the connection to real dollars. Because I think if you talk about it theoretically, it's a much harder argument, you know, versus you say, look, you made this decision, 10 people use that feature. Your team made this decision, a million people use that feature. And the difference between the 10 and a million mm -hmm. yeah. was a lot of money. <laughs> Kami, I want to ask you in your work, how important is it to engage various stakeholders? I think the first short answer is absolutely critical. And, you know, building on your point, I would say that intelligence is actually dialectic. No one of us owns the concept of intelligence. Not that I am intelligent or um, that Chumba is intelligent, but that really through the act of having conversations and interacting, you create intelligence, right? You, intelligence is connecting dots, and the idea of connecting dots means that things need to interact in one way is for exchanging knowledge and, and sharing that knowledge in order to then extract some piece of wisdom out of it. So that's, I would say, the more general answer. When it comes to our actual business, um, it's, it's fundamental. It's actually the, the basis of the business, right? Because what we are doing is we're using a part of artificial intelligence called natural language processing. And what that does is it basically recognizes patterns within text. And we're leveraging that in order to categorize lots of disparate pieces of information at various different solution approaches um, and um, their impact on, on downstream 
uh, manufacturing processes in order to paint a sort of more complete picture of that particular solution. And so bringing together these different diverse perspectives across different industries even is foundational for the platform that we're building because we are providing a scientist or a um, product designer really with a superpower, as I'd like to use your word there, with a superpower to identify patterns in this mass data that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And that mass data comes from very, very different places. The last thing I'll say is that on a business leadership level, it's actually um, the, the sort of foundation of, of how we're building out um, our leadership is intergenerational. So my co-founder is, is several years older than me, uh, Camille, and I found that through the combination of our different life experiences, me spending 15 years in the climate space, him spending 10 years in sort of the big data space, we're able to bring those different perspectives together and I wouldn't be able to be a, do what we're doing at this speed and, and scale if we wouldn't have that sort of intergenerational collaboration. That's so important. And Chamba, Tuwali has a localized focus. Yeah. How do you engage a wider grouping to help with its operations? Sorry, how do we engage a... How do you engage a wider group mm. to help with the operations? Yeah, yeah. Um, so our localized approach... Um, it comes from, we, okay, one struggle that we have at Tuala Spaces is that we're dealing with two, two forms of laws, where we're dealing with traditional laws and customary laws that people have always used and always lived by, and then we're also dealing with, um, for instance, child marriage was a huge debate because customary law says one thing, and then um, legal law that we're adopting as a nation is different. And so when you're navigating those two spaces, there's a lot of conversations to have. Um, there's a lot of conversations to have between those who have all, always followed customary law and are questioning why are we shifting, and then also those who are looking at the legality and the effects of laws that have been harmful in the past and tradition that has been harmful in the past. So it's, um, it is various stakeholders that we're bringing to the conversation. But one thing that I did want to touch on just um, from the point that you made is we need to start thinking more about our intention. Um, our intention in terms of as we move businesses, as we move forward, because what happens with not engaging various stakeholders, not, not engaging everyone that um, is in the piece is that when you use that dicta dictatorial leadership form, you, the business might be successful, the profits might be, might be gaining, but one challenge that you will have is then the population around. You start to see um, income differences. You start, to see, you start to see a widening of a wealth gap. And this is a challenge that we're also having on the continent where um, currently our, with presidents, a lot of people are in for five years. And so you want the short-term results. You want to build the road. You want to fix whatever is small. But no one wants to invest in education or health because the results take longer. And so then it's about... Um, when you invest in the short term, we invest in the dictatorial, dictatorial approach, which gives you results immediately. You miss the long term, which is the overall growth, the overall development of a nation, of a country, of a business. And yeah, just wanted to add that. Thank you, Chamba. Yeah, mm. I want to move on to challenges. Mm. I'd like to ask both you and Cami what you feel your biggest challenges are. And then I'd like Nigel and Sarah Kate to offer words of advice. So, Cami, let me start with you. What do you feel your biggest challenges going forward? It's a, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think personally, uh, on that level, there's sort of the personal side and then the business side. But I think on a personal level, um, there's a challenge that the company that we're building, if it's supposed to be successful, I'm going to be leading that, hopefully, for the next decades plus. Um, because while we're starting with that focus on developing strategies, really our long-term vision is to build the infrastructure for emission control that helps our entire society um, optimize and maximize our capabilities of actually 
reducing CO2 emissions initially, but then branching out across many, many different sustainability criteria because they're all interconnected. And the reason why I mention that is because it's a very long journey and it's many, many different phases. And it will require me to turn into many different leadership forms um, that, that will allow us to successfully move that business forward. And so I think that's probably on a personal level, I see the biggest challenge ahead for me to successfully lead this business. Thank you. And Chamba, for you, what do you feel your biggest challenges? Yeah, I would say access. Um, I got my passport about 10 hours before my flight here because oh. I was waiting on a visa God. to come here. It took, a, it took yeah. the longest time for me to get a visa. And I'm here, thanks, thankfully, to the sponsorship of Wear Family Foundation and SAP. But without that, I wouldn't have even been able to be in this space. And um, for funding of my nonprofit, it's been every year has always been what's going to happen. And a lot of that is, you know, we haven't really been able to get structures like being a 501c3 or being registered because those take a lot of investment to get structured. And so for my organizing, there's been barriers to accessing funding, accessing spaces like this, because a lot of it, there's barriers that we can fix. We can fix the visa issues. We can fix and say, how can we get more young people in the spaces? How can we get more Africans to attend spaces like this? And so a lot of it has been an access issue where I think we can all do more. We can all, do, we can all extend a little more to create, yeah, to open the door, create more tables, just more spaces for young people, um, different identities, uh, minority identities to be in these spaces. Mm -hmm. Nigel and Sarah Kate would love your words of advice. So maybe starting with, with Cami, actually, I, I think for me, one of the things, if you were thinking about leading a company, uh, having been on that journey myself, one of the things I think that was really important to me is you have to have a vision for where the business is going to go, but you also have to find a way to connect other people that you bring on who will extend and shape that. You know, as a founder, one of the things you tend to do is it's not quite the dictatorial idea, but it is something where you have a very clear idea of what you're trying to create. But the other people that you bring on board and, and, and bring into that journey will continue to shape and evolve that. But you still have to be the champion of where this thing is going. And so I use this analogy often with our teams of the cathedral and the rocks. So you know every day you're doing stuff that feels like you're breaking rocks, but unless you hold the picture of that cathedral in your head saying that's what we're trying to build, and this is how what you're doing fits, and this is how what I'm doing fits, and this is how to create that constant drumbeat of connection to the bigger idea. Because as a company scales and as you get more people, we're almost 20 plus thousand people in you know, 20 or 30 countries, it starts to get really hard because the 19,561st person that comes in has to be connected the same way that the first five were. And the first five had access and proximity and, and, and were able to connect better. But you know, as you scale, that, that becomes important and more and more important for you as a founder, but also for the people that you bring on. So that's just one thought as you were talking about your own desire for how you see the business evolve. Yeah. And Sarah Kate? I would think um, for both of you, I think the most important thing about being a leader and a founder and an entrepreneur is the ability to pivot. Because every day, I mean, she asked what your biggest challenge is, but I imagine that changes on a daily basis. Tomorrow, something else is going to be thrown in your lap, and it's going to be a visa, or it's going to be a funding need, or crisis, or something, or a great thing. And your ability to, in the moment, not get attached, and pivot, and keep moving, and find solutions that make what you're doing stronger and smarter, I think is going to be one of your secret you know, superpowers because the ability to constantly iterate and be agile doing that is in this, I think, culture and world that we live in essential to success and as entrepreneurs and especially marginalized entrepreneurs in, in, in the worlds that we live in, that's critical to, to being successful. Thank you, Sarah. Kate, we're going to move on to social media. Of course, the theme here in Davos is cooperation in a fragmented world. Can digitalization help bring us together, Nigel? 
I feel like, you know, right now, as, uh, you know, as we started the conversation, we talked about how today everybody has at least the ability to put their viewpoint across, right? And I feel like today, more than ever, as the world gets more fragmented with the four C's of, you know, the remnants of COVID and climate change and conflict and cost of living and inflation, these are all big societal issues. They're all macro issues. All of them need huge amounts of collaboration huge amounts of cooperation. And for me, if you think about uh, digital more broadly uh, of countries, of organizations, it starts to create the ability to start to share viewpoints, understand perspectives, and influence in a way that was just not possible before. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that it hasn't also created haves and have-nots, and it's not to say that there, there aren't divides between groups and people where inequity still exists. But for me, I feel like it is absolutely a force for good. And so often we talk about uh, you know, how it's being used in, in a harmful sense. And that's really important because we have to highlight that. But I feel like in that narrative, what gets lost is what it's enabling. It's enabling you know, healthcare in, in the work we do from the United States and, and from Western Europe to reach you know, markets that otherwise might not have. I mean, the development of the vaccine was just a, a kind of a, another example. It took such huge collaboration yes. across the world in order to get vaccines you know, made, identified, distributed, and tracked all of those things, right? So for me, I feel like it is what we make of it, but it certainly has the platform to be digital for good, which is very much how we as, a, as an organization think about technology in the world. And Sarah Kate, has social media, do you think, changed the way the LGBTQ plus community engage with the wider world? And has it brought up any problems? Oh, no problem. I mean, I don't even, this could be a oh, whole session, be, I know. And I'm trying to stay optimistic and hopeful and positive here. Um, but I, I, I'll come on the end in a hopeful and positive way. Okay. But we Thank do you. at GLAAD have uh, what we call the Social Safety Media Index, um, where we measure the top five platforms for safety of our community. And they all fail. <laughs> so, um, and that means that People who identify as LGBTQ are being harassed and abused on these digital platforms. This was a wonderful organizing mechanism for us as a community, really wonderful until it really took a turn. Um, and so we're trying to right size that ship, right that ship um, now. And it's a challenge because it's gotten so massive. Um, but I think that in order to change things, you do have to measure things. You have to start somewhere. And so using this, this index that we have and measuring where they are and creating roadmaps mm. to success, which we are seeing ad adoption of from these major companies, um, Twitter has fallen off that. They were a leader and now are, are awful. Um, <laughs> and so I think that we have a bright future here because Social media is such an important part of the world for our community. It is a place where we find each other when we're isolated. It's a place we connect and we organize. And now that it's been weaponized against our community, it is a moment that we need to take that back and protect our community. Chamber and Kami, has social media been a force for good in the work that you do? What's your relationship like with social media? Do you want to start? I was going to ask you the same question. Okay. Yes. Um, so the honest answer is that I did not engage with any social media until very recently. I, in fact, I, I decided when I was, I think, seven years old that I wasn't going to watch any movies because um, I had this sort of idea that if I was going to watch movies, that that would detract me from all the things I wanted to change in the world. Uh, and I read instead a lot of books and, and so on. Uh, I would say the, the, the simple-minded nature of a, of a young kid. And then over time, I think, change, began to change my perspective on generally digital communication and, and uh, in particular how do you maintain a good relationship with it that doesn't become addictive? Mm -hmm. Because that's what I already noticed at a very young age, that even just sitting in front of the TV, which we didn't have at home, but at friends' places, was very addictive. It felt addictive, and I sensed that, and I was like, wow, that is not something I want to be exposed to. On the flip side, I joined social media, starting with Instagram, because I saw how Greta, you, you mentioned Greta uh, Thunberg, um, 
use that as a rallying tool, right? And that's the way that these climate movements, youth climate movements really organize. And so I started seeing the, the, the possibilities and the capabilities. And honestly, I don't have an answer. It's still a, a daily struggle to figure out what's the right balance. But I do think that in, in a world that is highly connected and where we need to collaborate across different chasms, that these sort of digital communication infrastructures are actually really critical because we're not all going to fly into Davos every single day, right? We're going to keep connecting with each sure. other through various forms of social media. Hmm. Yeah, similarly, um, I'll use the, fresh ex the French expression, comme ci, comme ça, where um, <laughs> there's, there's been we good, like that. <laughs> there's been good and bad. Um, I'd say the good, I see TikTok just hosted an award ceremony in Kenya where they awarded their top African creators. And we're starting to see more stories, like more, where we're helping fight the single story through social media, where people are coming up with different voices mm. and you're even seeing yeah, different songs come up, different trends. And so you're seeing more representation as social media, um, as, as more people get access to dig digital access mm -hmm. and um, the internet. But also then there is the weaponization and those with ill intentions that are also using the platform to spread fake news, to spread um, face false messages, to spread hate. And so, you know, with everything, there's, there's that good and bad, which is why, um, I, I like to lean towards hopeful that I, 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 I'm, I'm quick, I'll block people, I will change my yeah. feed. So the way I navigate my feed is to try and promote the good and really, but I'm, I'm not ignoring the bad that is happening on social. Yeah. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for for this discussion. <laughs> Just a final, very, very, very quick lesson learned piece of advice. Very quickly, Nigel, I'll start with you. Technology doesn't equal social media. You okay. know, so. Chamba? Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me come back. <laughs> okay, Cammy. Collaboration requires empathy to cross divides. Wonderful. Mm. Sarah Kate? Um, pivot, pivot, pivot. <laughs> we need to go back to centering people. Mm. Well, to all of you, thank you so much for joining me here today. We're so excited to have our first Visionary Network panel here. And thank you so much to the We Are Family Foundation. And what a wonderful collaboration. We look forward to it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>